Welcome to our Iguana Head Start facility. So within this whole facility, we have just over 500 iguanas. You know, we have multiple generations. So we have iguanas um, going back to 2019. We have iguanas that hatched in 2020, iguanas that hatched in 2021, 2022, etc. Our latest hatching group is from the ones that hatched last year in 2023. And so they hatch out every August, September. We bring that group here and then raise them up. So the basic idea behind the Head Start program is um, to kind of usually protect an endangered animal uh, that has some kind of threat in the wild that is threatening younger newborn hatchling animals. And so the Head Start program for the Jamaican iguana started in the early 90s. So the iguana is actually thought to be extinct up until about 1990 when um, a famous pig hunter, not famous, now famous pig hunter, Edwin Duffus, was hunting pigs up in the Hellshire Hills and discovered a small population or small couple of iguanas. And he knew this was abnormal. He actually caught one of the iguanas and in 1990 brought it to Hope Zoo, who then notified Dr. Peter Vogel at UWE, a herpetologist at UWE. And everyone was in total disbelief. You know, this is this, you know, Jamaican iconic animal, you know, that's found nowhere else in the world that was thought to be extinct. And so that kind of started up this big conservation initiative to protect, you know, what, what's still remaining. And so from then they found out kind of a couple key things they needed to protect is one, at that time, I think there was still possibly around 20 to 40 animals that were actually still alive. And so they needed to protect the nest sites where the females are nesting and then also address the threat. So the main threat was invasive animals, so non-native mongoose that have been introduced to Jamaica and feral cats that were killing all the baby iguanas. And so what we do with the Head Start program is uh, since the early 90s is catch up the baby iguanas as soon as they're kind of born in the wild and we bring them to Hope Zoo and then they're raised for four to five years till they're much bigger size faster and then they're released back into the wild at about four to five years old um, and this improves their survival rate dramatically because at this size they're now obviously bigger and stronger and they can escape from those non-native predators and so since the early 90s um, you know back then they formed this kind of conglomerate which is called the, now the Jamaican Iguana Recovery Group which involves, you know, NEPA, Hope Zoo, UE, um, the IOJ, UDC, kind of everyone that came up with this management plan to protect and preserve our critically endangered Jamaican iguana. So prior to, you know, rediscovering them, what exactly caused their extinction? It's a combination of a few factors. So prior to like, let's say, early 1800s, they are commonly found distributed along the south central coast of Jamaica and the Goat Islands. They think by the, pretty much by the early 1900s, um, they were totally wiped off the mainland of Jamaica and the last remaining iguanas were only found on Great Goat Island. And then they think by 1940, they were totally wiped off Great Goat Island. And so the main kind of threat that was made them go um, nearly extinct was the invasive species. Um, you know, the cats, the mongoose, um, invasive like wild pigs also will dig up nest sites and eat the eggs. And then obviously goats, um, you know, are, these iguanas are herbivorous, so they're feeding on native plants and fruits, and that's obviously what goats eat. So goats kind of outcompete them for what they would normally eat. The invasive animals are pretty much eating all the offspring, all the young ones. So there was some adults in there up in the wild, but they're laying eggs and all the babies were getting eaten. So, you know, there's no new generations that were coming up. And so um, they pretty much got, that was the main thing predating them. Mm -hmm. Was there any human threat? I know that... Um, humans have so there, some part to play sometimes. Back in the day, there was, you know, hist you know, not today, but historically, you know, especially in the early 1900s, you know, there are accounts of people that people used to eat them, um, yeah. especially on Great Goat Island, I think, when there's even, you know, the military base was there and everything, and there, there are accounts of some people eating them, uh, but I, we don't think that was a big contribution, you know, to their kind of status, but it, I mean, it definitely didn't help. So besides the invasive species, um, habitat loss from charcoal burning uh, is also a major threat. So the iguanas, where they're found on the south coast in Great Goat Island, um, they're found in what's called this tropical dry limestone forest. And it's actually its own ecosystem in its own. And it's this kind of uh, ecosystem made up of these kind of native and endangered uh, kind of dry forest plant species. Um, and so with the charcoal production, you find people that are coming into the forest and cutting down the trees um, to make the charcoal. And this was contributing a lot to the loss of habitat because in this dry forest, you know, you're cutting down the trees and these plants and you're taking away the iguana food as well. Mm -hmm. But th did the charcoal production itself bother them at, at all? I'd say 
probably at the time, I mean, it definitely helped reduce their, their ha shrink the habitat. It was destroying, like, which was this essential habitat. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, the, obviously, the main contributor would have been them getting killed by, you know, the invasive species. Okay. Yeah. Describe to us what's the real purpose of iguanas in the ecosystem. Okay, so it's, it's really neat. So people often ask, like, oh, why, why protect the Jamaican iguana, you yeah. know? And so first we always like to say, it's Jamaica. It's a Jamaican icon. You know, it's an endemic species, which means it's found nowhere else in the world. You know, there's about 45 iguana species around the world, and the Jamaican iguana is only found in Jamaica. And it's the most, out of all those 45 iguana species, it's the most endangered iguana. It's one of the most endangered animals in the world. If it's wiped off Jamaica, it's gone forever, you know. And so it's just, it's part of our culture and stuff, which we, you know, should protect, like, any animal, anything. Um, but they're important for the ecosystem, and they're actually incredibly important for the ecosystem um, because they provide great benefits to the forest as a whole, which benefits all native wildlife. So we kind of have a saying, there's a couple sayings. So one, we call them Jamaica's first farmers um, because they feed on native plants and fruits and they help with the dispersal of those plant species because when they eat the fruits, they're obviously eating seeds. And then they're running around the forest and they're pooping out those seeds. And that helps with the seed dispersal of those plants. They're almost kind of spreading the growth of the forest by eating those fruits and spreading around and spreading those seeds as they kind of defecate around the forest. Um, and number two, uh, they actually, there's a really neat study done a, a few years ago where they took, you know, normally fruit seeds will fall on the ground and then it takes some time for them to germinate and the plant to grow. Mm -hmm. Well, what they found was they took normal seeds fall, found on the ground and they took seeds from iguana poop and the seeds from the iguana poop actually germinated something like five or six times faster. So not only are they spreading out the growth of the plants, but they're speeding up the growth of these plants. Because they pretty much find that as they eat the seeds, their digestive system breaks down some of those layers of the seeds. So once they are defecated out, it speeds up that germination process. So they're speeding up the growth of those plants, which obviously helps birds, mammals, other reptiles, you know, just helps the forest in general. Mm -hmm. um, and so because of that, they're actually called, you know, kind of a scientific term for them is called ecological engineers because this one species benefits the whole ecosystem and all the other wildlife involved. Talk to me about the, the goal that Head Start program has about Hellshire Hills Forest, having 6,000, I think it was? 1,000. 1,000. Yeah. yeah, so to date, right now, since you know the first the, the Head Start program, they started collecting iguanas in the early 90s, like 91, 92. The first release was in 1996. Okay. Um, and from then to now, we've now, actually this, this last year, we had a really good year last year, um, we have now released just over 700 iguanas back into the wild. Mm -hmm. And so our goal is by 2026, you know, by about two years, is to hit a thousand iguanas. So that will be a thousand iguanas that have been reintroduced into the Hellshire Hills um, since obviously the conception of the program. And then the long-term goal, and which is the necessary kind of saving grace, kind of which would be the saving grace for the species, is the reintroduction of iguanas back to Great Goat Island. So obviously right now they're literally, you know, like I said earlier, they used to be distributed all across kind of the south central coast. And now the area where they're found up in the Portland Bight protected area in the Hellshire Hills is literally, it's less than 510 square kilometers. That's their natural, that's the only place they're found right now. And it's protected by four NEPA rangers that live up there all year around um, that are setting up traps to help eradicate the uh, cats and mongoose, which helps keep the population kind of stable. But in that, which is called like our core area, um, because it's called somewhat of like an open system, no matter how much they're trapping, these animals, the invasives, these cats and mongoose are just gonna keep coming in. So as a long-term goal, it's not very sustainable. And that area, you know, can probably hold maybe a thousand or a couple thousand iguanas, which, you know, if you're looking at the sustainable, sustainability of a species, it's not gonna be enough. So obviously with Great Goat Island, um, you know, several years ago, there's a very disastrous threat of them developing it into, you know, the Chinese um, shipping kind of, they're pretty much going to wipe out Great Goat Island and put a shipping port or something, you know, something in there. Luckily, that was halted and protected now as Great Goat Island's idea of turning Great Goat Island into this uh, wildlife sanctuary. Because obviously, besides the iguanas, there are birds and stuff that are naturally found there. Um, and Great Goat Island is big enough that it could easily be home to probably close to 10,000 iguanas, which mm -hmm. would be the saving, kind of like I said, the saving grace for, for the species. Um, but right now, there's currently obviously goats and mongoose um, and other animals found there. So the goal with kind of the iguana program in general is to ideally, over the next few years, raise funding to get 
um, all those invasive species kind of eradicated from Great Goat Island. And then because it's an island, um, you know, then it's protected. So then we can just start putting iguanas there. So, you know, as iguanas um, hatch in Helsher, instead of, you know, bringing them to Hope Zoo and Head Start him, we can take them to go straight to Great Goat Island in the mm -hmm. wild, and then they can start flourishing in the wild on their own. Yeah. Yeah. Probably a thousand kind of seems small to some people, but... Yeah, it literally, yeah, it is. Given, given the fact that you started from the 90s. Yeah. Yeah, but um, tell me why is that, though, in terms of the numbers? Is it that you're, you're capturing to... Um, capturing a small amount of numbers to, to then reintroduce? Yeah, so the thousand, um, you know, it sounds like a small number, but it is a, it's, it's a big number in the aspect of what is being done to, for the reintroduction, but in the wild, you know, it's actually a very small, because if you give in the area, even though it's only 10 square kilometers, like literally, even when we go up there to release iguanas, you can walk around for hours and not even see an iguana, because one, they're very kind of elusive and shy, they're very well camouflaged, so even if you're trying to find them, even with a th even when there is a thousand iguanas there, they're nearly impossible to even see. You know, yeah, the number may seem small, um, but given that this started in the '90s, and you know, at the time there was, they're not even sure, maybe 10 to 20 adults there, okay. which is probably a small number of females. So each f adult female iguana typically will lay about anywhere from six to maybe 30 eggs. And so kind of the reproduction process is usually around May is the nesting season. Mm -hmm. And so the females will typically find, because um, up there, like I said, it's a dry limestone forest. So the ground is literally jagged limestone, but then you find these patches of nice red sand dirt. And so that's what they need for nesting because the females will dig a hole that goes a few feet into the ground mm -hmm. and they'll lay their eggs in that hole, cover it up, and then the female's gone. So that's around May. And then usually about almost three months later, around August, September, those eggs start to hatch and those babies hatch and start coming out of the ground. Um, and so, you know, with the Head Start program, you know, now we have this big, beautiful facility where we house over 500 iguanas, but that was just built here, I'd say, I think around 2016, 2017. Prior to that, there was only a few small cages. So they're very limited by the number of iguanas, you know, for the first, you know, 10, 15 years, they could only bring anywhere from 10 to 40 iguanas back every hatching season, you know, so then that's only, you know, four to five years later, that's only, let's say, 30 to 40 iguanas that are being released. Um, and so it was a very grow slow process of, of actually reintroducing iguanas. Now with this new facility, we're able to, every hatching season, we're able to bring about 100 to 150 babies back. And, um, and now we're increasing our release size to anywhere from 80 to 100 okay. iguanas. Three years ago was a record-breaking year because before that, the average number of iguanas, baby iguanas that we were bringing in for the head starting was about, let's say, 50 to 60. And, and it was in 2021, we brought 150 hatchlings. And that was partially due to the iguanas now breeding and kind of growing in the wild, but also we got some funding to uh, build more cages here. Um, because the iguanas, when they're younger, they... When they're young iguanas, they get along very well, and we can have, you know, eight to ten iguanas in the same, you know, big cage. But as they get older, the males get very territorial, and so they have to be separated. So for most of, you know, the first 10, 20 years, they can only bring so many iguanas back because we didn't have the housing at the zoo. And then last year, 2023, was a record-breaking year that we released 100 iguanas in one year, mm -hmm. uh, which is very exciting. So that's why, you know, right, right now we're at about just over 700 released. And like I said, we're hoping by 2026 hitting a thousand, um, which is, which is, I don't know, sounds sounds like a small number, but it's actually a very big number because, um, like I said, with the how slow the reproduction process is, and um, a lot of people don't realize, like you know, a lot of Jamaicans still don't know about you know, iguanas, let alone the conservation program. But this is actually like a world kind of famous conservation program. It's known as kind of a a success story in like I guess the world of, of wildlife because a lot of times with you know head start programs were started off using for seed turtles and they've used them for other animals um, but a lot of times you find failure a lot of times you find failures with head start programs because the whole goal of the head start program is not only that you're releasing them is that number one they're surviving you know because you're raising these animals in captivity and then you're throwing them in the wild so are they gonna be able to survive and feed on their own and number two they need to start reproducing in the wild. So if, if you're just putting them there and they're not reproducing, then your population's not growing. And so the awesome thing, amazing thing with this program is that um, 
I think it was around 2008, they had the first Head Start, first documentation of Head Start iguanas that were reproducing. This, now, if you had a female that was Head Start at a Hope Zoo, released to the wild, and now she's actually breeding and reproducing in the wild. Um, and so we're seeing an increase in hatchlings and nest sites in the wild. Um, and so from, you know, the success of, you know, raising at the zoo and the release, and now of these Head Start iguanas are actually doing very well in reproducing in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, and so... I think, you know, the long term, like I said, the long term goal is eventually we're going to have to hopefully get Goat Island protected and releasing there. Yeah. yeah. Um, tell me about if there is any monitoring process and what does that entail? There's a year round monitoring process to protect the iguanas, to study the iguanas and eradicate, get rid of the constant threat of you know, these invasive species, the cats, the mongoose, even feral dogs and pigs. Um, so there's four NEPA rangers that live up there year round, I mean, in the bush, like, like harsh environment, but they're like camping up there mm -hmm. year round. Um, they have what's called like a loop of a couple, two to 300 traps that are set every day to help catch these cats and mongoose, um, to help kind of keep that threat down. Um, they're also, you know, along the way, they're, if they, they're catching up iguanas that are out there um, to make sure they're doing well. Um, so anytime an iguana is captured in the wild or anytime any of the Head Start iguanas come to the zoo, one of the first things we do is we give them a pit tag, which is kind of like a tiny microchip that goes underneath their skin. And that microchip has a, a unique 10 digit identification number to it for that iguana has this number and no other iguana has that number. And so that's a way is once they come into our system, we have a large database with every, every single iguana and their number. And so if we catch up this iguana, if we go up in the Hellshire Hills today and catch up an iguana, we can scan it with a special device and his number will pop up. And then we can put that number in our system and be like, oh, this guana was born in 1994. He was brought to the zoo in 1994. He was released back into the wild in 1996 when he was, you know, 200 grams, you know, 1,000 grams. You know, now he's 8 kgs. And so it's, it almost creates like this medical database and file for every iguana, both in captivity and in the wild. Um, and so that's a, one of the ways we monitor them is through the pit tagging. There's obviously um, one of our kind of partners and collaborators is, is Fort Worth Zoo in the U.S. in Texas, um, and there's uh, a Ph.D. conservation researcher, Dr. Stesha Pasashnik, who she works up there with several grad students that are constantly studying iguanas by putting um, transmitters on them to track their locations in the wild. You know, that's part of the way, one of the ways we found out that the hatchlings or the head start iguanas were surviving is after they've been at the zoo for four to five years, we'll, we'll select some to put a special transmitter on them after they've been released, and then we can track their movements over a period of time to look like, all right, hey, look, they're surviving, they're eating, they're doing good, and that's how we know they're surviving. So, mm -hmm. and then we can also put transmitters on adults to kind of get an idea of where they're moving, how big is their home range, you know, what are their preferred trees or habitat like. Um, and so that's another way they're monitored as well. During the health screening exercises or any other medical exercises, yeah. is there any um, issues that you found in the iguana, such as perhaps disease or anything like that, that you don't want to make mention of? So fortunately not. So over the years, you know, we've done this health screen. We do these annual health screens where, you know, fortunately we have found no diseases. But kind of the ideas behind the health screen is um, every year um, there's like this week, actually about a two-week period where we catch up every iguana in the facility, you know, over 500 iguanas. And um, we collect updated body measurements, you know, body length, body weight, and we get blood samples, fecal samples. Um, where we have a special team of biologists that can look at those blood and fecal samples, you know, and look at different blood chemistry levels, you know, making sure there's no parasites, making sure there's no abnormal, you know, kind of nutritional values and stuff. Um, and so we have both our veterinarians at the zoo and even some local veterinarians. We have some biologists from Fort Worth Zoo, San Diego Zoo, um, and Bronx Zoo in the U.S. that come down and help do training on some of this stuff, but like world-renowned vets that come down to help with this assessment. Those iguanas come to the zoo as soon as they hatch, Every year we're getting body measurements on them, which allows us to look at their growth rates. Are they growing naturally? Is, sometimes you, we do get ones that are kind of stunted or growing slow. And so typically that might be, well, maybe he's in an enclosure with some dominant male, so he's not getting enough food. And so what we can do then is like, all right, we need to move this iguana to its own enclosure so then its growth rate can get back to normal. Um, we have found kind of no diseases, but we have fortunately found... Um, we do, a lot of the adults, we do ultrasound on. So we have a nice new ultrasound machine that we got through some great funding a couple of years ago. So now, especially with the females and uh, even the adult males, we'll ultrasound them. 
and a couple there's been a couple years where we found a, a big bladder stone in them um, which made sense because we had this one iguana in the head start facility um, for the months prior was kind of very bloated he wasn't eating normal you know we weren't sure what was going on and so then we did the ultrasound and he found it we had a giant I could show you a picture he found this giant bladder stone in him that was kind of impacting like his digestive process and probably very painful and so we were able to do the surgery right there in sight, remove that bladder stone, and then he was back to healthy again. Um, we can also use the ultrasound to look at um, kind of egg development in the females. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot uh, known about the Jamaican iguana, uh, but typically in some other iguana species, females typically, typically become mature or sexually reproductive around five, six years, but you know, you're, we're not really sure for these ones. And so what some of our older iguanas here that are maybe three, four years, we've started to see egg development in them from the ultrasound machine, which let us know is like, hey, you know, they're actually fertile, you know, reproductively active, you know, at this younger age, which is neat to see. Yeah. Uh, but fortunately, we have not seen any diseases um, or anything like that that would cause severe health, uh, severe harm to the, the, the population. One of the main goals of the annual health screen is obviously assessing the health and body condition of all the iguanas, but we then select the next group of iguanas that will be released that year. So we'll look at, you know, the next, let's say 40 iguanas that are the oldest ones that are supposed to go out and we'll make sure their health is tip, you know, tip top, you know, very healthy, no parasites, you know, no abnormalities. And so once they're kind of checked off that they're healthy and good to go, then they can be released back in the wild. Because mm -hmm. the last thing we want is, you know, an iguana that's in the facility that maybe gets some disease or gets some parasite here and then we reintroduce them to the wild and then that parasite or that disease is then reintroduced to the wild population. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my final question would be actually um, if there's anything that, you know, regular Jamaican citizens can do to help in any way. Okay, so that's a good question. One of the ways kind of we're getting, kind of encouraging people to help um, is, is one is education because um, a lot of people don't know about the Jamaican iguana specifically, and that it's kind of like, you know, this cultural icon. Um, and so we're trying to, you know, a couple years ago, we created this nice iguana fun education book that we're starting to hand out to schools, um, especially to teach the kids about the iguana program and, and you know, why they're, why they're kind of important to Jamaica. Um, and so kind of spreading that knowledge and education, you know, we're not asking people to love the iguanas. We know, we all know that Jamaicans often have a very big fear of reptiles, especially lizards. And so by no means we're asking people to love them like, like we do, but respect them, you know, you know, this is, you know, just like reggae music or any part of our history is part of the Jamaican culture. We want people at least respect that. Um, so we can, you know, do our part to kind of keep that here. You know, the last thing we want is to be, you know, reading books to our kids about how this, the Jamaican, well, this extinct animal that used to be here, you know, so we want to keep it around, um, you know, not only are they important to the wildlife, but they're part of the Jamaican culture. Um, and obviously, no guys poaching of trees for charcoal burning, especially for the people that live in that Hellshire area. Um, you know, we really try to condemn, and you know, it's obviously illegal, but um, educate them on you know how bad it is for not only the guana but the forest in general of cutting down those big because they have to cut down large chunks of, of forest to get enough wood to make that charcoal. Um, and so we try to educate people on that is a big thing we can do to help protect them as well. Yeah. yeah.